Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our annual joint webinar with the Canola Council of Canada. I'm Marianne Fezenden, Academic Liaison and Webinar Coordinator for Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems, or AMTS. We have been offering educational, non-commercial webinars in Ruminant Nutrition since 2015. These webinars are called The Nutritionists and offer bilingual, multinational webinars with experts around the world. In the last four years, we have also teamed up with the Canola Council of Canada to offer canola amazing webinars meant to help educate nutritionists using canola and ruminant diets. I am joined today by Dr. Essie Evans and Brittany Wood of the Canola Council, as well as our featured speaker. I will leave Brittany to introduce Dr. Penner, but first I want to remind you, the webinar is being recorded for later access. I will send out links when the recording is listed and ready on our YouTube channel. Please also enter your questions in the Q&A window or the chat window, and I will ask them at the end of the webinar, and we'll go back and forth. Um, I want you now to meet Brittany Wood, our co-host. Brittany joined the Canola Council of Canada in November 2012 and manages the Council's utilization program that promotes promotes canola seed, oil, and meal in key markets of importance for the industry. In addition, Brittany manages the Canola Meal Research Program and works towards disseminating the results of the research to industry to raise the value of canola meal in the diets of livestock species. Brittany holds a master's degree in agricultural sciences at the University of Alberta. Join, uh, prior to joining the council, Brittany worked with Manitoba Agriculture and Rural Development on program to fund implementation of beneficial management practices on Manitoba farms. Brittany, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and introduce, and then I will stop my screen share. Great. Thanks very much, Marianne. Uh, it's really been a, a pleasure to be working with AMTS for the last four years, as you mentioned. Um, I think it's uh, been a great opportunity to exchange information back and forth. So thank you for that. Um, and as you mentioned, we do also have Dr. Essie Evans on uh, the line with us today. And Dr. Essie Evans has worked closely with me since I started at the council and is also a really instrumental part in uh, disseminating the research uh, to um, nutritionists like uh, the ones we have uh, with us here today. And so just quickly about the Canola Council of Canada, we are an industry association in Canada. Uh, as part of our mandate, we are very committed to research and uh, part of that research being on canola meal specifically. And so um, we're really pleased to have Dr. Greg Penner here today uh, to share some of his research and I will uh, introduce him. So Dr. Greg Penner is a professor in the Department of Animal and Poultry Science and holds a Centennial Enhancement Chair in Ruminant Nutrition Physiology at the University of Saskatchewan. He was hired in 2009 after obtaining his bachelor's degree in 2004 and master's degree in 2006 at the University of Saskatchewan. And his PhD from the University of Alberta in 2009, where I had the pleasure to meet him. Dr. Penner's research focuses on forage utilization, beef and dairy cattle nutrition, and regulation of gastrointestinal functions and ruminants. Individual projects range from a focus on fundamental aspects of physiology to those with wide outcomes that help promote efficient and sustainable beef and dairy production. Through his research program, Dr. Penner has trained 26 undergraduate students, 21 master's students, eight PhD students, four postdoctoral fellows, and has participation. In addition, Dr. Penner has hosted five students from other universities while they conduct a, for a portion of their research under his supervision. The output arising from the student training and research activity includes over 160 papers in university journals and over 130 invited presentations. Greg also serves as the co editor in chief of the And with that, Greg, you'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Brittany. Screen shared here. Does everything look good on your side? Excellent. Very good. 
Wonderful. I, I'm really happy to be here um, sharing some of the work we've done evaluating canola meal use and, and really strategies to help improve utilization of canola meal. Uh, and our focus in these uh, research projects really looked at uh, helping to ensure that we can promote gastrointestinal tract development uh, to allow that calf to utilize canola meal. Before getting started, I, I want to acknowledge uh, collaborators that were involved in this project. So uh, Kasia Burakowska uh, was a PhD student at the time, really uh, led the vast majority of these projects. And we worked very closely with uh, Dr. Pavel Gor Gorka and Zygmunt Kowalski uh, at the University of Agriculture in Krakow. So I think, you know, when we look at uh, some of the challenges of, of utilizing canola meal for young calves, uh, first of all, we need to recognize when we're dealing with this pre-weaning and weaning transition, uh, we're dealing with a calf that is really a non-functional ruminant, uh, or at least uh, that calf is developing into a functional ruminant. And so we can think about uh, feed additives or feed ingredients more like we would with monogastrics. And in that case, we need to think of some of the challenges that are present uh, in canola meal or could be present in canola meal or rapeseed meal, depending where you are uh, in the world. Uh, so historically, um, you know, we, we have concerns over glucosinolates and uricic acid, although the concentration should be very low, if not uh, nearly absent in uh, canola meal. Uh, we need to think about other factors, phytate as an example, and probably most important when I think about canola meal use uh, for young, ca young calves is really the high fiber content that we can find in canola meal relative to other protein sources. The combination of some of these factors uh, could lead to, or has been speculated, to lead to lower palatability, lower nutrient digestibility, and, and consequently, quite often we see a reduction in feed efficiency. We thought uh, that there might be opportunity to enhance canola meal use, particularly given, at least at the time when we started this work, that there was limited use of canola meal uh, in starter mixtures. And again, like I mentioned, the reasons for that were fairly well documented in both old research and relatively recent research. Uh, work out of the University of Guelph had, uh, had reported a reduction in palatability when canola meal was replacing soybean meal. Others have reported reductions in starter intake. Again, we need to pay attention to the times or the dates of these studies because we could be dealing with different quality uh, of canola. And again, even initial work done at the University of Alberta showed that there was a reduction in dry matter and crude protein uh, digestibility. However, when you look through the literature, the results really are not consistent. Uh, so there were evidence, both from old studies and, and a recent study, showing that starter intake is not always depressed when canola meal replaces soybean meal. And in some cases, we actually don't see alterations in growth performance of the calves. So we thought we could uh, maybe advance our knowledge, given that there are a number of different technologies available for us and greater knowledge in general in terms of when we are or how we are formulating starter mixtures for calves. So first of all, we, we probably don't need to look just at individual ingredient substitution studies. We can think about other additives that we might be able to use to stimulate gastrointestinal tract function. And if we can stimulate gastrointestinal tract development and function, we should be able to positively stimulate efficiency of digestion. We might be able to override some of the palatability challenges that had been reported utilizing other uh, flavor sources, such as molasses or glycerin, to help improve palatability uh, and maybe um, override some of the challenges we have thought we had with canola. And then the other aspect we can look at is canola meal is high in certain amino acids, glutamine and glutamate, as well as uh, cysteine. Uh, and glutamine and glutamate in particular are really important sources of energy for the gastrointestinal tract. And so there were some questions on whether or not there could be a, a positive influence on gastrointestinal tract function. 
So we set out a series of studies and, and the first one we were looking at was really going back to the literature and looking at heat treatment of canola meal. And, and the concept for this was really to uh, try to stimulate uh, bypass glutamine and glutamate. Uh, thinking about this probably more critically, we probably don't need to worry so much about bypass glutamine and glutamate uh, simply because we're dealing with a relatively undeveloped gastrointestinal tract. The other side of that was heat treatment could help reduce some of the anti-nutritional factors that still could be present in canola meal. So the goal was to see whether or not we could actually use heat treatment approaches. And we evaluated a wide variety of heat treatment approaches. Essentially, we chose 110 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes because it had the least negative impact on estimated intestinal uh, protein digestibility. And so we thought would be most beneficial for uh, our young calves. As I mentioned in the past uh, slides, we also wanna look at some other factors that might be able to be used in combination with canola meal to help stimulate starter intake, as well as help stimulate early development of the rumen through greater production of butyrate uh, through ruminal fermentation. And so we also evaluated glycerol inclusion in these studies. So this is an overview of the composition of the starters. What I do want to be very clear in this case, these starters did not contain uh, any soybean meal. So these were canola meal driven starters. We have no heat treatment, no glycerol, no heat treatment with glycerol or heat treatment with no glycerol and heat treatment uh, with glycerol. So you can see glycerol was included at 5% of the dietary dry matter and uh, canola meal, whether heat treated or not, accounted for about 34% uh, of the starter mixture composition on a dry matter basis. We attempted to balance crude protein uh, at around 20.5% for all the starters. There was a, a small increase in crude protein associated with the heat treatment. So there's a, about a half a percentage increase in crude protein concentration uh, for those studies or for those treatments. Uh, and starch concentration was obviously reduced when we incorporated glycerol because glycerol was used uh, as a substitute for barley grain in this uh, study. So we used 28 Holstein bull calves in this study. We started the experiment at eight days of age and we fed milk replacer for 49 days of age. One other factor we wanted to consider is much higher milk, milk feeding. In this case, it was milk replacer feeding rates that we commonly see in the dairy industry, uh, particularly in Canada. So we're looking at maximal milk replacer feeding rates of 15% of body weight using a very gradual step down weaning process. In this study, what we did see is that uh, as we started including heat treated uh, canola meal, we saw a tendency for a reduction in starter intake. And we saw an increase in starter intake when we incorporated glycerol. So no interaction effect in, in uh, starter intake, but we did see uh, that heat treatment really had a negative effect. In this diagram, when you're looking at uh, the uh, overall figure, what you can see is the individual steps that were implemented where calves were decreased uh, milk replacer allowance. And not surprisingly, as we start doing that, we start seeing increases uh, in starter intake. As a consequence of uh, a tendency for a reduction with heat treatment, for starter intake, we also saw a tendency for a reduction with heat treatment for average daily gain and a tendency for an improvement in these uh, in the growth rate of these calves when glycerol uh, was included. So it does look like uh, at least we can start utilizing other components, stimulating responses in canola meal based starter mixtures, uh, maybe in this case with the inclusion of glycerol. We evaluated the weight of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, again, in this case, we didn't see a glycerol effect, but we did see a reduction in the weight for ruminal tissue as we increased or provided heat-treated canola meal. 
And we also saw a reduction in the weight of the genome, so part of the intestine, as we increased canola meal uh, heat treatment inclusion. So it, unfortunately, while our, our original hypothesis was that we might be able to deliver more glutamine and glutamate, I think there's questions uh, related back to palatability and probably digestibility, uh, challenging whether or not that heat treatment actually delivered available amino acids uh, to these young calves. We also saw, as we had speculated, that providing glycerol in these diets could actually stimulate uh, the expression of certain transporters that are involved in uh, carbohydrate or monocarboxylate uh, transport, uh, amino acid, essential amino acid transport, as well as uh, peptide degradation. So monocarboxylate transporter one and four is actually expressed throughout the gastrointestinal tract. It's a really important transporter for movement of short chain fatty acids for ketone bodies, as well as lac lactate uh, across the gastrointestinal tract. And it's, it's localized on both sides of uh, the intestinal tissues. And we saw in this case, both MCT1 and MCT4 were stimulated uh, with the inclusion of glycerol, suggesting that there may be some uh, both ruminal and maybe even intestinal effects of, of glycerol supply. We saw an interaction between heat treatment uh, and glycerol on, on our glutamate transporter, uh, EAAC1. In this case, providing heat-treated canola meal in combination with glycerol actually resulted in an increased uh, expression. Um, still some questions over activity in terms of that transporter, but at least from an mRNA perspective, we do see an, an increase. And then dipeptidase, uh, dipeptidase 4, uh, a, a peptide or a peptidase enzyme uh, released by the brush border membrane uh, tended to be increased with glycerol. So again, suggesting that some of these other functional ingredients might be able to improve utilization uh, of starter mixtures, particularly when uh, canola meal is included. So what we observed in this study in terms of the impact on the gastrointestinal tract, obviously we had reductions in starter intake and average daily gain as we included heat-treated canola meal. We had a reduced ruminal tissue and digestive tissue or digestive weights, reduced jejunal tissue and reduced jejunal length, a reduction in ileal digesta, cecal digesta, a reduction in colon length. And while I didn't report the data, we had a reduced butyrate proportion uh, in rumen fluid in this study. The other side of that is looking at the glycerol effect and the glycerol generally improved or, or provided positive responses where we had improvements in starter intake and average daily gain, improvements in abomasal duodenal digesta weights, increases in jejunal tissue and digesta, an increase in colon tissue weights, increases in the concentrations of ruminal short chain fatty acids, which came at a consequence of lower ruminal pH. And there's some questions over ruminal acidosis and what ruminal acidosis really looks like in young calves. And then as I showed, we did see some increases in intestinal indicators for intestinal activity based on our mono monocarboxylate transporters, our glutamate transporter expression, and increased uh, activity of dipeptidase. So certainly some uh, challenging outcomes, but still some positive results showing that we could stimulate gastrointestinal tract development with glycerol. Now in that study, we only incorporated canola meal as uh, the driving protein source. And, and that really doesn't tell us much about how we can evaluate or whether we can improve canola meal utilization. We know, again, when we look at the literature, there's variable results, but it's often propagated that we see a reduction in starter intake, a reduction in average daily gain, and reduced palatability. One other functional ingredient we wanted to look at was uh, microencapsulated sodium butyrate. And microencapsulated sodium butyrate really has sodium butyrate en encapsulated within a tri triglyceride matrix. There are previous reports showing improvements in starter intake and average daily gain, 
uh, an improvement in growth of ruminal papillae as well as uh, within the intestine, increasing villi length and increasing total weight of the small intestine. So again, we thought if we could combine uh, different protein sources with our microencapsulated sodium butyrate, we might be able to stimulate a more positive effect. The starters in this case either incorporated soybean meal or canola meal, and then within that protein source, we uh, in included microencapsulated sodium butyrate or MSB, uh, or we did not include uh, MSB. Again, learning from our previous study, we incorporated glycerol in all of the diets, uh, and our microencapsulated sodium butyrate inclusion was 0.3% uh, of the dry matter. We also balanced methionine in this study, uh, knowing that uh, canola meal has a higher methionine concentration uh, than soybean meal, so we wanted to eliminate uh, that effect. The other aspect we need to uh, highlight is uh, all of these substitution effects are not as clear to evaluate uh, simply by replacing ingredients. So because canola meal has a slightly lower uh, crude protein concentration than soybean meal, our inclusion rates in the starter have to be higher. And as a consequence, we have to make a decision on what we're going to substitute as we include canola meal. Because barley had a higher fiber or has a higher fiber content than corn, we chose to substitute part of the barley uh, as we increase canola meal inclusion. So just be aware that when we evaluate these uh, crude protein sources, at least uh, within this study, we are not controlling for starch. And so our canola meal starch, so canola meal starter mixtures also have a slightly lower starch concentration. We ran this experiment using both bulls and heifers. So these bull calves allowed us to evaluate gastrointestinal tract uh, characteristics. The heifer calves were used exclusively for performance uh, indicators. What we did see in this study supported some of the previous uh, research that when we replace 100% of the soy with canola, we see a reduction in starter intake. Uh, and in this case, what we did see is a tendency for a positive effect of including microencapsulated sodium butyrate in terms of starter intake. We also evaluated growth responses. So before weaning, absolutely no effect, but we did detect a negative response uh, on average daily gain during the weaning process when we included canola meal as a replacement for soy. So there uh, is some suggestion that we might have some problems in terms of delivering digestible nutrients during that weaning phase as they're shifting from that milk uh, fed program onto a solid feed program. However, calves were able to adapt after weaning. In this case, we saw no differences in average daily gain between those calves fed uh, soy, uh, soy, uh, soybean meal or canola meal as a primary protein source. And throughout this, we did not see any positive effect of incorporating uh, microencapsulated sodium butyrate. The growth responses and the intake responses are supported by dry matter digestibility data. Uh, again, here it's only a tendency, but we did see a tendency for reduced dry matter digestibility as we incorporated canola meal into these starter mixtures. But we have to remember that this is not perfectly balanced for starch. We did see a reduction in starch uh, supply going into the canola meal based starters. And we have to come back and question whether some of that dry matter digestibility decline was due to starch or whether it's truly due to the protein source. When we look at rumen development, uh, in this case, we did see an interaction between our protein source uh, and the inclusion of microencapsulated sodium butyrate. Really no difference uh, between any of the treatments for soybean meal with or without microencapsulated butyrate or canola meal on its own. However, in this case, actually incorporation of microencapsulated sodium butyrate with canola meal led to a reduction in absorptive surface area for the rumen epithelium after weaning. And the data in this case are, are somewhat variable, where in some cases we see a positive effect coming from microencapsulated sodium butyrate, and in others, 
we see a negative effect. And I think this relates back to uh, a very strong dose response for butyrate where low doses can be quite positive and high doses can have negative effects. Again, we evaluated the relative mRNA expression of monocarboxylate transporter, a really important transporter in terms of uh, moving uh, short-chain fatty acids and lactate and ketones across the rumen epithelium. And we can see, even though we did see that uh, interaction for absorbed to surface area, when we look at relative transcript abundance, we see a positive response uh, when we feed microencapsulated sodium butyrate. We do see alterations in other components, and, and I think this is a really interesting response, and, and we have other data that also observed a, a similar response where abomasal tissue weight was actually tended to be greater for calves fed canola meal than soybean meal. And I think this relates back again to uh, potentially slightly lower digestibility uh, of canola meal than soybean meal, implying that there might be increased residence time or delayed abomasal emptying coming from canola meal-based starters relative to soybean meal-based starters. Again, this is speculation based on changes in abomasal tissue weights, uh, but one of the ways that we might be able to explain the outcome. We also saw increased jejunal tissue weight uh, for calves fed uh, canola meal relative to soybean meal. And again, we can look at these relative weights and, and think of both positive and, and potentially challenging attributes. From the positive side, it might suggest we actually have a larger genome, maybe greater potential for digestion uh, of post-ruminal nutrients. However, we also need to think that a larger gastrointestinal tract likely also consumes more energy, and hence it might increase the maintenance energy requirement for these calves. Looking at our uh, peptide transporter uh, messenger RNA expression in the jejunum and ileum, again, we did see uh, an effect of protein source. In this case, we saw a reduction for canola meal in peptide mRNA expression in the jejunum, and we saw an increase in ileum. So it might be affecting supply of these peptides or relative dis or supply of these peptides to different regions of the gastrointestinal tract probably also related to changes in the weight or length of the tissue, uh, given the response uh, that I showed you in the previous slide. When we look at aminopeptidase as, as one of our peptidases uh, released by the brush border enzyme, uh, we can see we did have a small uh, tendency for an improvement when uh, microencapsulated sodium butyrate was incorporated. Uh, we saw that increase in enzyme activity in the duodenum, and we also saw an increase with butyrate uh, in the ileum, but no differences occurring in the proximal jejunum, mid-jejunum, or distal jejunum. So a little bit um, curious on why we see some of these differential region effects, however, showing really a similar response with stimulation arising from microencapsulated sodium butyrate provision gives us some confidence that we might be able to stimulate intestinal development with butyrate. So again, if we review the impact on the gastrointestinal tract for our bull calves, canola meal resulted in increased tissue weights uh, of the abomasum and jejunum and a longer jejunum as well, which probably led to some of the changes in PEPT2 transport, uh, transporter expression, and maybe also some of the other uh, signaling molecule uh, receptor expression uh, within the intestine. That said, we did see a reduction in digestibility as we incorporated canola meal as a replacement for soybean meal. But again, this was 100% replacement and we couldn't, in this study, uh, control dietary starch. So there is a, a confounding effect that we need to be aware of. In terms of butyrate, we saw an increase in the digestive weight for the omasum, an increase in aminopeptidase activities, both A and N uh, aminopeptidases, an increase in MCT1 expression, but we did see some potentially uh, negative effects in terms of reductions in the absorptive surface area, particularly when canola meal was fed in combination. 
Looking at the same study, but in this case, looking at the heifers just from a growth performance response uh, and also increasing the power to help us improve the ability to, to detect differences. In this case, we actually did not observe uh, negative effects that we observe for our bull calves. Now, this might question whether there are sex-based effects or if it's really just power differential between uh, the two studies because we have a, a greater number of experimental, experimental replicates in this component, but really no differences in terms of starter intake before weaning, uh, during weaning, after weaning, uh, or overall. No differences in average daily gain. And fecal scores, while there are some differences here with protein source, uh, it looks to be fairly positive where lower scores would be more indicative of normal feces, although I think the biological significance of these changes uh, probably can be questioned. That said, we did see an interaction for days with diarrhea where those calves fed canola meal uh, had fewer days with diarrhea when fed with butyrate than those calves that were fed uh, soybean meal. So again, not always do we see negative performance responses arising from canola meal inclusion, even when canola meal replaces 100% of the soybean meal. And there may be even indications of improved responses uh, based on uh, diarrhea scores. So again, all those studies that we looked at so far use canola meal as the sole or primary protein source really what we can do is back up and start evaluating how much canola meal can we uh, include and, and evaluate whether or not uh, we can see uh, alterations in performance. So this was the first study uh, we conducted evaluating canola meal inclusion rate. Uh, this was led by Pavel Gorka in Poland. We had a 100% canola meal or what we classified as 100% as canola meal diet. We replaced 50% of the crude protein uh, with canola meal or 100% of the crude protein coming from soybean meal with canola meal. So we can think about the soybean meal and canola meal uh, combination providing 50% of the crude protein from each of those protein sources. Again, I should mention when we bring in uh, canola meal in this study, we replace barley grain. So again, we do have a reduction in starch that we need to think about as we're interpreting these results. In this study, when we evaluated the response, we had a tendency for a treatment by time, but it was not what we would have anticipated. In this case, there was actually no reduction in starter intake as canola meal replaced soybean meal. Okay, There was only a numerical reduction, and actually the numerical reduction was for a tendency for soybean meal to have lower starter intake. Despite that, we did see reductions in uh, average daily gain as canola meal uh, increased. So when, when we used uh, contrast, we saw that the canola, uh, sorry, the canola diet had lower growth for the during the first 28 days of the study relative to soybean meal. No difference from day 29 to day 56. But when we look at the overall growth response, there's a numerical reduction when we compare soybean meal alone to canola meal alone. We evaluated fecal score in this study. Again, lower numbers would be closer to normal. A score of four would be diarrhea. In this case, we observed the opposite effect to what we saw in the previous study, where during the first 28 days, those calves fed canola meal actually had a higher fecal score than those calves fed soybean meal. No differences from day 29 to 56 or when we look at the overall growth phase. Evaluating feed efficiency, again, we did see when we have 100% replacement of soybean meal with canola meal, uh, we see a reduction in uh, feed efficiency for the first 28 days and that reduction in the first 28 days carries over to influence the overall 56 day uh, feed efficiency response. Now we did see the response with 
soybean meal substitution, but when we replaced 50% of the crude protein coming from soybean meal, we did not detect any differences. So it does provide support that we may not um, we may, may not be able or we may not see differences in terms of um, average daily gain and feed efficiency when we do partial replacement of canola meal rather than full replacement. So we wanted to follow that study in another uh, experiment where we had a more detailed inclusion level for our canola meal and soybean meal. Again, we're looking at the proportion of protein that we're replacing from soybean meal with, with canola meal. And in this case, we used a little bit more of a complicated uh, dietary uh, substitution strategy where we balanced not only for crude protein, but we also balanced for starch and NDF, trying to remove some of those confounding effects that I highlighted in the previous studies. When we look at daily starter intake, there was no effect during the milk feeding phase, although during this phase, we know starter intake is low. We did see a linear reduction in starter intake during our weaning transition phase or our step down weaning phase. And we also saw a linear reduction in starter intake as the inclusion of canola or crude protein from canola increased uh, while replacing soybean meal while holding starch and fiber constant. So it does look like we are going to see a small reduction in starter intake with increasing inclusion of canola meal. Average daily gain was not affected overall. Uh, we did see a cubic response during the milk feeding phase. A uh, little hard to explain cubic responses, but it looks like 45 or 60 percent might result in a small reduction in average daily gain during the milk feeding phase. We didn't see any effect on average daily gain during our step down weaning transition or post weaning. And so it looks like at least once you're beyond the milk feeding phase that calves have adapted to uh, up to 60 percent of the crude protein coming from canola meal. We did also evaluate apparent total tract digestibility, so no differences in dry matter digestibility, supporting that some of the responses in previous studies might be partially accounted for by uh, changes in starch. We did see a quadratic response for uh, crude protein digestibility with a slight decline as you move towards 60% of the total pr crude protein no difference in starch digestibility and a quadratic uh, response for ether extract digestibility with highest values occurring when 30 and 45% of the crude protein came from canola meal. So the overall imp implications uh, of this work, well, first of all, uh, I think our hypothesis was, was partially supported uh, in terms of negative effects from whole canola replacement but certainly we showed that partial replacement of soybean meal with canola meal, and in our studies, up to 60%, probably won't have much effect on starter intake, average daily gain, or uh, uh, feed efficiency. We do see some changes with uh, gastrointestinal tract tissue weights, as well as potential indicators for gastrointestinal tract function with canola meal. Probably the biggest um, influence is if we get into canola meal that could be heat damaged. In the studies that I showed or the study that I showed, we were dealing with heat treatment, but I think this really would be analogous to heat damaged crude pro or heat damaged canola meal. And I think this could be a something that we would assess uh, as we're looking at potentially incorporating more canola meal into starter mixtures for calves. It was very clear from heat treatment uh, that as we got into that heat-treated canola meal, we started seeing uh, pretty detrimental effects on performance in gastrointestinal tract uh, development. And this might help explain some of the variability in the responses observed in previous literature, just simply based on variation in canola meal uh, quality. We did observe that glycerol helped to stimulate ruminal fermentation, uh, driving some improvements for indicators of gastrointestinal tract function, 
from a production standpoint, increased starter intake, increased average daily gain, and a larger uh, jejunum. And we also observed variable responses, but somewhat positive responses for microencapsulated sodium butyrate, where incorporating MSB uh, pre-weaning increased starter intake. Post-weaning, we saw some potential negative effects where we had a reduction in ruminal absorbed to surface area uh, due to decreased epithelial uh, weights. With that, I'd like to uh, answer any questions that, that you may have or, or entertain some discussion. I also want to thank uh, the co-authors, uh, Kasia Burakowska, Pavel Gorka, and Zygmunt Kowalski, as well as the funders of our research, uh, the Alberta Crop Industry Development Fund, Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, SAS Canola, Western Grains Research Foundation, uh, and Top Farms, which was one of the farm locations where the work was conducted in Poland. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Penner. I am going to um, share my screen for a moment and have Brittany sort of talk a little bit about the Canola Council and a new, um, yeah, I should start my video, I hate that. Um, <laughs> a new, a new, a new video that we have, or that a new booklet she has, and then we'll get to the questions. We have some in the the chat window and or in yeah in the q a window and then um we'll go to whatever anybody wants to ask so go ahead Brittany. okay thanks a lot and thank you dr penner i know there'll be a, a good q a section here coming up um i just wanted to direct your attention uh to canolamazing.com so that is uh, a website where we uh, are regularly putting up all of uh, the research that is out there on canola meal. Um, and specifically, we have a new version of our ruminant uh, canola meal feed guide. Um, so this image you see here is, is not, uh, not exactly that, but I will drop a link into the chat maybe, and that uh, can, can get people right there. Um, it is a 2023 version of the feed guide uh, for ruminant animals and uh, Dr. Penner's work is is included in it as well. And with that, I think if uh, there are also some past webinars that we've done together that are available for viewing, uh, you can find those on the AMTS website or the Canola Amazing website. Uh, and a lot of uh, that data that's presented in those webinars uh, focus on canola meal inclusion in the milk and cow. And uh, as well, I know Marion has some links here to the nutritionist series that AMTS offers, and you can find all those there. Um, I think that's probably it in terms of my role here. So I'll pass it back to you, Marion. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Um, let's start off with some questions. I have, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to start off at the top. We had a question from um, David Casper, are you suggesting that you fed too much butyrate? And I'm going to stop my share, Greg, so that you can go back to sharing um, if you want to sh share your particular um, screen. Okay. Sure. Uh, so thanks for the question, David. Um, in this study, we were feeding 0.3% of the pellet dry matter as microencapsulated sodium butyrate. Based on the available literature, that seems to be the optimal level. However, there are some discrepancies on when that uh, microencapsulated sodium butyrate is provided. Certainly when it's incorporated into milk replacer programs for young calves, quite consistently we see a positive response. When incorporated in pelleted starter mixtures, we don't always see uh, a positive response. This could be due to uh, altered uh, butyrate production or altered supply. So perhaps there was too much butyrate uh, in the intestine or the intestinal regions where uh, microencapsulated sodium butyrate becomes available. The other thing I, I think we need to think about is where butyrate might be most effective. And the literature is not clear on that. Um, we are not sure how far down the gastrointestinal tract microencapsulated sodium butyrate uh, will be released. 
Uh, and hence, uh, there's some challenges in terms of interpreting some of the bypass butyrate information. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, let's go to the next question from, from Dr. Casper. I'm curious to know if you believe the canola diet um, are are protein deficient. In my opinion, your protein levels are borderline combined with other lower digestibility and could create a deficiency. Yeah, I, I think that's a good comment. When we did this work, I think uh, at least based on the modeling predictions, we had expected that 20 to 21% crude protein should be adequate for these young calves. I think there's some newer data suggesting 23, maybe even 26 crude protein percent crude protein might be more beneficial. And so uh, part of the response that we're observing could be uh, challenging the gastrointestinal tract in terms of extracting digestible crude protein uh, or digestible protein from uh, the dietary components. From an experimental standpoint, I think that's probably a good approach because then we're able to truly test uh, the availability of those nutrients from the different protein sources. Uh, however, from a applied production perspective, uh, I think you're right. Maybe we could have achieved slightly higher performance responses. That said, our calves grew very well, uh, partly because we feed relatively high amounts of milk or milk replacer in these studies. Uh, so I think from a performance standpoint, I'm not too concerned um, but I, I do take your comment on marginal crude protein supply uh, with, with some seriousness. Okay. Thank, thank you. Moving, moving along, um, a question from, and I apologize for murdering anybody's pronunciation, um, Nicholas Eng Englade. Um, in those different trials, did you follow up the rumen bypass fraction with a different with the different regimes? If not, how do you estimate it? That's a great question. And we had many discussions over uh, how we should be estimating ruminal passage rates or post-ruminal flows of amino acids uh, in these studies. In the first study where we evaluated the heat treatment, we used a very simplified approach. So we used nylon bags in mature ruminants, which uh, I think we can all recognize might not be representative of what's happening in the rumen of a young calf. Uh, so there are some critical challenges with assessing the need for bypass protein and the availability of that bypass protein in calves. Uh, I think that's something we're going to have to move to with stable isotopes or uh, another approach like that. But we were unable to address that in the current studies. Okay, thank thank you for that answer. Um, I'm gonna bring everybody's attention to the fact that I have put a couple links in the chat window. Um, one was for an update of the book that is showing, and then the other is the website for the Canola Council of Canada um, Canola Amazing webinars. They are also um, up on recording. And I will remind you that when we do put these up, we put it up on YouTube with links on our web page, and also there'll be links on the Canola Council. And I will provide in the web page that I create, I will provide links to these documents so that it's easy for you to move between the two. Um, the next question, and this is from Dr. Casper, have you evaluated NDF intake as a percent of body weight or gut fill? If the calf has limited gut capacity, then the higher undigestible fiber is limiting energy and protein supply. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's an, another great question. Um, I struggle with, with the concept of um, UNDF or fiber limitations for dry matter intake in, in pelleted diets, particularly for calves during a milk feeding phase. I think we probably don't pay enough attention to factors regulating um, abomasal emptying and other satiety signals that we're well aware of in monogastrics, but uh, unfortunately might not pay enough attention to in ruminants. So I'm interested to understand you know, why we see that reduction in intake, if it is a, a palatability response, or is it a 
physical restraint. I think it could potentially alter albumasal emptying. We did see alterations in albumasal tissue weight. We did see alterations in intestinal weights uh, and intestinal length. And so I think there might be other mechanisms than, you know, the classic rumen fill that we think about for mature ruminants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's there need there's um, much research still need to be done in that area. Um, a, a comment and question from Dr. Hutchins. Great webinar. Your data on glycerol and MCB is interesting. Would you recommend adding it to calf starters? With uh, the glycerol um, inclusion, the responses we got back in the first study were quite positive. And uh, I would say a limitation is we maybe didn't reevaluate glycerol utilization. So we have a single study showing some quite positive stimulatory effects. And, and we took that data to heart and incorporated in it incorporated glycerol into most uh, of the remaining studies that uh, we conducted. It looks like glycerol could be quite positive in terms of stimulating intake and stimulating gastrointestinal tract development. So I'm keen on uh, incorporating glycerol into starters. Microencapsulated uh, sodium butyrate is, is a little bit more challenging because we did see that variable response. Uh, it's no doubt to me that there are positive responses during the milk feeding phase. I think post weaning, we need to think about um, whether if it will be beneficial uh, or not. So I think for MSB, uh, I think the jury is still out. Okay, thank you. Um, Brittany is has a question she would like to ask. Sure, thanks a lot, Greg. Um, I'm just uh, thinking to your part of uh, the country and um, what we know that canola processing expansion is gonna increase here in the coming years. So uh, just for, for anyone on the line, um, we have uh, quite a significant growth in our processing expansion plan for Saskatchewan uh, in the coming years. And we know that there will be canola meal available in the marketplace. Do you have any kind of maybe practical advice for um, formulators who are potentially gonna be in a situation where it makes a lot of sense to use canola meal and you know, maybe what's the, the best way to start that process if they aren't already using canola meal for cows? That's a great comment. And yeah, we're looking at close to a doubling of our canola crushing capacity. And so there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, regarding canola meal availability here in Western Canada. Um, in terms of using it for calves, I think there's a couple things we really need to think about. And unfortunately, we didn't do the best job in the early experiments. I think we made up for that at the end. First of all is recognizing that you can't simply just substitute uh, one protein source for another um, unless they contain same amino acid composition and the same crude protein concentration. So because calves were still looking at crude protein concentration largely for formulation, need to recognize that as we increase canola meal inclusion, we have to substitute space of resulting from other ingredients. So I think it's, it's probably most beneficial to ensure that we're not compromising energy supply coming from fermentable carbohydrates uh, as we try to incorporate uh, more crude protein uh, coming from canola. So really thinking about balancing the fiber fractions, the starch fraction, along with crude protein as we're making these dietary substitutions. Great, maybe one more quick one. Do you have any um, any research questions that you think are, are remaining that would be good to better understand canola meal use for calves? Yeah, I think, you know, some of the questions that we got back here were some of the burning questions we still have Remaining, uh, we don't know a lot about intestinal digestibility of uh, protein sources for calves. So some of this is canola meal centric. Some of this is just basic uh, biology and physiology of calves. Having a better understanding of um, intestinal supply and probably more like a monogastric approach, ileal digestibilities, I think could help us move forward 
uh, in understanding amino acid uh, availability and supply for young calves. Okay. Um, thank you. And unless I get more questions in the chat or the Q and A window, I think that it, we we've answered all the questions that were coming from our attendees. Um, Dr. Penner, thank you so much. Dr. Casper says thank you, Dr. Penner. Um, <laughs> and Brittany and Essie, it's always delightful to work with you. Um, it was great to see a lot of um, friends who have who attended and everybody interested in calves. So with that all said, I will um, say goodbye. And I'll get an email out to all of you who signed up to attend, letting you know when the the um, recording is processed and available for, for viewing. So unless anybody has any burning questions, we'll all say goodbye. All right. I give them so much time to put in those burning questions. All right, everybody, have a great day um, or a great day tomorrow if you're on the other side of the world. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.